Over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about intimacy with God. And just because I'm not focusing on intimacy with God as far as what we read and what I teach, I don't think that that means, believe, means that our intimacy stops with Him. But I actually think it's something that we build upon. And last week, I said a couple things, you know, tithing our time to the Lord. You know, you got to start somewhere. And I'm not expecting that everybody's going to be giving, you know, two and a half, two hours, 40 minutes a day to, to the Lord. But I, you know, started, started somewhere. But I'm hoping that for those of you who took the time to create this space for the Lord, I can feel the intimacy in this place. And I love how the enemy sometimes tries to call me like, he just tries to steal, he just tries to steal your joy. This morning, I just came in church, and I wanted church to be so good, because honestly, last week, church was so good. I was just like, Lord, would you do it again? Lord, would you do it again? And sometimes, isn't that just like us when we're expecting to see something from God, and, you know, we're so high on the expectation of what we want to see, it's just, well, maybe it's just me. I just got anxious, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of this worship set, it's just like, God, this is better than anything I could even imagine and hope for when I just let it go. But I also know it's from a place because we're coming from a place of intimacy. We're allowing ourselves to get to the throne room. But today, I want to talk about the giver and the gift. Everybody say the giver and the gift. The giver and the gift. So let's off with James chapter 1, verse 17. And it says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. It's James chapter 1, verse 17. God the giver. Not to be mistaken with our sugar daddy, the one that answers to everything we want and answers on command. Not the one that's just, you know, ready to bow down and everything we ask him. But the giver of life. The giver of purpose. The giver of our values. And the giver of good gifts, as James chapter 1, verse 17 says. Jehovah Jireh, which means my provider. This name was given to God by a man named Abraham. If you go and you read in Genesis, there's a man named Abraham. And the Lord says that he looked upon all of the earth and there was one man that he saw that was faithful. His name was Abraham. But to be tested, Abraham and his wife were barren and they were growing old in age. And God blessed them very, very old in age with a child named Isaac. But to put Abraham to the test, God told Abraham to sacrifice his son, Isaac. So as Abraham was going up this mountain with his son, and the son is asking the father, are we supposed to be going up this mountain for a sacrifice? But where is the lamb? Where is the ram? Where is the animal that we're going to sacrifice? So trust in the Lord. God will provide. So Abraham gets up to the space where he was to go and to perform the sacrifice, knowing in his heart that God had asked him to sacrifice his son. As Abraham is going through, because as you know, he was known as the most faithful. He goes and he pulls out the knife or whatever he was going to use to stab his son, and all of a sudden the angel of the Lord came to him and he says, Stop. He says, I have provided you a ram in the bush. And Abraham looks and he sees this ram that he's called to sacrifice. Abraham left that moment in such joy for not having to sacrifice his son that he loved and the son that he was blessed with. And he says, God, you are Jehovah Jireh, my provider. You are the giver of every good gift. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. This is something that Abraham 
said. But I think we also can say that God is Jeho Jehovah Jireh to us as well because I don't know about you, but for me, God has provided time and time and time again. Who here has had God provided for just in the nick of time? When you felt all hope was lost, just as Abraham was going to go ahead and to sacrifice his son, when he thought all hope, this thing that he loved, was going to go and leave him, Jehovah Jireh showed up. And it's the same Jehovah Jireh, our provider, that still shows up for us today. And just as that ram was a gift, God also sent us the most precious gift that we could ever ask for. And his name is Jesus Christ. And although we were, or some of us may not be known as the most faithful on the earth, that wasn't the reason why God chose us. God chose us because his son, Jesus Christ, was the most faithful. And with him living a faithful life, a sinful life, a life without sin, he became the pure and holy sacrifice for you and I. And it wasn't by our faith and it wasn't by our works. So that none of us could boast. But by the works of Jesus Christ, where God provided Jesus, sacrificed himself for us. While we were yet sinners, Romans 5, 8. While we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. The perfect gift. The perfect sacrifice. The most precious gift. But I have news for you. Did you know that you are treasured by the Lord? Did you know that you are a gift of God? A gift from God. Turn to your neighbor and say, if you're breathing, you're qualified. Now turn to your other neighbor, your second choice, say, if you're breathing, you're qualified. And, and we all know you got imaginary friends, so if you're not sitting next to anybody, that person who talks to in the shower that I often talk to, tell them, if you're breathing, you're qualified. But I guess your imaginary friend would not be qualified because they're not breathing. But anyways... So we all are a precious gift from God. We all have a purpose. We all have a value. And God made us in his image. And when he put breath into our lungs, whether you choose to come into relationship with God or not, the potential of your purpose and value is still there. All my theologians are like, hey, I don't know if everybody is a treasure to God, but no. While we were yet sinners, Jesus died for everyone. Why? Because he saw something in that sinner. He saw something in that person. He saw a treasure. He saw a gift. Because if that wasn't the case, there was no point for him to die on the cross. But yet he did, because he wanted to unlock the potential of his gifts. It's you and I. So there's a diversity of gifts in this room. Some people call to heal. Some people call to prophesy. Some people call for exhortation. Some people call to move mountains of faith. The spiritual gifts you find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But there's also these other gifts that we have and talents that God gives us. Some of us are handymen. Some of us are teachers. Some of us are accountants. Some of us are, I don't even know, but I'm running out of names of job descriptions. But you know who you are. And God has given you a talent and a gift in the spiritual and in the world, and they're both called to be together. And God is the giver of these gifts. He's the giver of your purpose. He's the giver of your value. But sometimes I think that we forget to thank the giver, not the gift, for what we have. We praise the gift, but not the giver, which is funny to me. Because I look back at my life and I look back at my relationships and as I was thinking, I was preparing my heart for this, my grandmother, Dolores Martin, she came to my mind. And I think about the time she's, she's passed away several years now. 
But think about the times and the relationship I have with my grandmother. And although my grandmother has given me many, many gifts, that's not what sticks out in my memory, are the gifts that she's given me. When I think about my grandmother, I think about the times where I would be in her Volkswagen Beetle that was there. My grandfather got her a license plate that said three times a lady. I remember sitting in the back and looking at different CDs, and I saw a CD in there with Nora Jones. I said, Grandma, do you like Nora Jones? And she said, Sunrise, sunrise. I just remember having a conversation with my grandma. She was just so, just what a grandmother is, just what you connect and you love and you, and you just want to stay connected and be around because she's all of those things. She's the giver. She's a provider. She's the one that cooks you the good meals. She's the one that gives you a stern talking to and pinches her lip and says, put lotion on your ashy knuckles and go put chapstick on your lips. You know, this is your grandmother, the one that I think about my relationship. And I can't imagine me thinking about the Ninja Turtle bike that she got me and praising the Ninja Turtle bike higher than my grandmother, although that little Ninja Turtle bike got me all the different places around their house. And I think about my grandmother, Ellen, who's still living, and I remember going to her home, and, you know, she would provide great gifts as well, and she would, all types of things, you know, I was spoiled, I'm spoiled, I'm still spoiled to this day, very spoiled. And she would spoil me with all types of gifts, but that's not what I cherish. I don't cherish the gifts that they gave me. I cherish the times where I just used to sing commission in her kitchen. She would sing with me and my cousin would come around. I cherish the times when she would pray for me because we, my cousins were watching a demon movie that they shouldn't have been watching. And I went into her room and she just prayed over me to calm my anxious heart. Those are the things that makes me all just overwhelmed with just wanting to thank the provider and thank the giver. How many of us are any of you guys then like? Like when you go back in your memory, is it the is it the gifts that you got? Although they're nice, or is it the relationships? Is that the most prized possession that you had? See, our culture today is such a consumer culture. Where it wants us to focus on the prize. It wants us to focus on the next thing, the next thing, the best car, the best house, the, the best of everything, the best shoes, the best clothes. It's not saying that God doesn't want you to have good things, but it seems like our focus has been shifted on what we can get out of life through our gifts, through our talents. And we get so focused on these gifts and these talents that God's given us that we forget to fall in love with the person who gave us all of these things. We forget to go to the one who started it all. And society will rather keep our focus. It'll hear what we talk about, about our favorite shoe or our favorite little gadget. And then all of a sudden it'll show up on our phone and we find ourselves for hours looking through different things that we want. And we can't spend 30 minutes in prayer thanking God for the breath of Consumer culture. But let us remember that there's a giver and a gift. And the gift is kind of like a double entendre thing. I'm not talking about God and the gift. I'm talking about God and the gift that he gave to us in Jesus Christ who unlocked more gifts for us. Is this making sense, church? I'm hoping I'm, I'm hoping this is breaking down. Amen. Something. Yeah. Amen. It's not about the what have you done for me lately culture of let's focus on the, res the results of things and not the process of things. God is steering us away from this society of lawlessness. The Bible says as it gets closer and closer to the end days that people are going to be, be deceived. And we're just going to practice things of lawlessness because our minds and our hearts are going to be wanting things and, and looking to things that are not God. So the only way that we can combat this is to what? To turn back to him to repent. Yeah. To repent.
First Peter chapter 4, verses 8 through 11 says, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all of these things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And when I read this, I'm like, this is a weighty verse. I'm going to read it again. First Peter, verses chapter 4, 8 through 11. We got Bibles in the back. I don't think we got them up here. Because I really want us to read this together. So for all you guys who got your phone, go ahead and get it out. And let's read it again together one more time. The giver and the gift. He's given us instruction. Above all, let's read it slowly. Love each other deeply. What does that mean to you? Because love covers a multitude of sins. Our culture condemns people who sin against us. Our culture says if that person has no value to you because of their failures, because they're focused more on the results of their life and what can be edified in their life. But that's not what the Word of God says. It says, above all, love each other deeply. The time for surface level Christianity is over. The time of us having arguments and loving each other through our arguments, loving each other through our differences, is now. And it says, because when you do that, your love for that person covers a multitude of sins. We ask ourselves, how do I know that I'm loving the giver more than my gifts? When I can overcome my own pride and stop looking at my brother and sister in judgment and love them. And show them a love that covers a multitude of sins. It says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. How do I know that I'm that I'm paying honor and praise to the giver and not just what my gift is. It means if God has given me a resource, that means if God has given me an ability, if God has given me a talent, if he's given me a gift, he's calling me to go out and to love my brother and sister in hospitality with a heart of hospitality, with an action of hospitality, without grumbling. And we all have been there and we still are there. And I'm not saying that that moment in your mind is like, oh, Lord, I don't want to today. I'm not saying we're, we got flesh that's in us. But he's saying, will you fight against that? And will you show up? Will you wash your face? Put some lotion on your face like the Lord's mark will tell me to do. And act like you couldn't wait to get to that person to show love to. And do it without grumbling. Chelsea nudges me in the morning at 12 o'clock, 12.30 when Baylor's waking up and we're trying to train her in this thing. Chelsea nudges me. I'm learning not to do grumbling because I already know that she's getting up the next two times to feed it. But my natural flesh would be wanting to be like, no. But in my heart, I'm like, you need to go and do that. So I'm practicing and learning to not do the things that I know I'm called to do. As a father, God has gifted me to be a father. This is the child that I prayed for. This is the child that I we weep over. You better get your mother out the bed without grumbling and praise God you're walking down that hallway to go tap that little button until she goes back to sleep. <laughs> Each of you should use whatever what? Oh, so you guys not reading with me. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. It goes back to God. It goes back 
to the giver. It's only by God's grace that you're standing here today. It's only by God's grace that he puts you in the situation that you're in. It's only by God's grace that you can walk up to that brother or sister. It's only by God's grace that you can show love. So in honor, in relationship with the giver, it says use your gift to serve others. How do you praise God over the gift? You use it to serve others and not to edify yourself. If you find that your gift always comes back for your own benefit, you're not, you're not appreciating the giver. If your gift is always surrounded about, and it's always about you and what you can do with your gift, you're not paying honor to the giver. See, because it's only because of him that I can stand up here and teach from his word. It's only because of him. Use your gift. The teachers, the engineers, the healers, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, the apostles. All of it. Whatever it may be. He uses all of you to edify his kingdom. He uses all of you to build up his church. It says, if anyone speaks, this is crazy. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God, period. Let there be light. And there was light. Let there be vegetation, and there was vegetation, vegetation. Let there be animals, and there was animals. Let there be waters, and there was waters. Let me make an expanse from his words. There was action. There was life that sprung forth his words. There was beauty that sprung forth in his words. And this word, and the word was made flesh, tells us that when we speak, they should, we should do so as one speaks the very words of God. So we, we should be slow to speak and quick to listen. Because as Christians, when we come into relationship with God, we are responsible for the reflection of his glory. What an honor that God chooses me in all of my shortcomings to speak on his behalf. This is not telling you to be perfect, but this is telling you to understand the God that you serve and move in relationship because he perfects you. And when you speak, speak on his behalf. And if it's something that you don't feel as though God's wanting to say and build up with someone, then don't say it. This is why he tells us to be slow to speak. Because he says there's life and death in the power of our tongue. There's life and death in the power of our gifts. Our gifts can be used to either build people up or cut people down. Our gift can be to build a wall or to break down the wall. So when he calls us to speak, when he calls us to move, and when he calls us to operate, do it as if it's the Lord using you. Bond servant. A puppet. I know that's a bad term, but God used me. If you can use me, I don't know how to sing that one plus in the background, but is this good stuff? Isn't the word of God good that like it just gives us instruction? Says if anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. How do we praise God and not the gift? Understand that what you're serving people with comes from the strength of God. He's the source of your being, He's the source of your breathing, He is the source of everything. So He's not telling you. To not go and serve. He's not telling you to not use your gift. He's not telling you to not use your talents. But he is telling you to recognize where those gifts and talents come from. He is 
He's letting you know where the power comes from. And it's through Jesus Christ, the best gift. To Him be the glory and the power forever. Amen. So there's a culture and there's a society right now where it's not based off of your skin color. It's not based off of your political affiliation. It's not based off of your occupation. It's not based off of the family you grew up in. It's not based off of your descendants. But it is a kingdom society that's going on right now. And it's based off of a relationship with the king. God, the giver. And in this kingdom and in this society, God gives roles. He gives gifts. He gives a diversity of gifts. And once you walk into the society and have a relationship, He reveals those things to you. And He strengthens those things. what ends up happening when you live in this new society that's not based on all the things that our society is based on, you end up living a life that is countercultural. Countercultural to what? To the society that we live in today. Be in the world but not of the world. So God is telling us to go into the culture and not conform to the culture, but to change the atmosphere and culture that's around us. And we do that through living in the kingdom society. We do that through kingdom unity. We do that through recognizing God, our king, God, our giver, God, the one of every good gift, as James says. So how do we become a church that's countercultural? Well, guess what? I can't do it in one sermon. So... For all of you guys who got the emails, like, what does this have to do with the book of Ephesians? <laughs> Pastor, you haven't opened said anything about Ephesians yet. The book of Ephesians that we'll be going over for the next five weeks gives us the full understanding of this new society that you've partaken when you come into when you come into relationship with God. Ephesians was written by Paul and he's writing to people in Ephesus where there was Jew and non-Jew, so that means Jew and Gentile, which was two completely different cultures that followed two completely different ways of life. And even within that, there were micro-cultures and microcosms of cultures in Ephesus. And so when Paul was writing to this culture, he's writing to a people who were made from different cultural backgrounds, all of the differences. And he's writing to them about this new kingdom that you find in Jesus Christ. And the story of how Jesus Christ came to bring a new culture and a new kingdom. And how you can celebrate the culture and the microcosms that you come from that have developed your talents and your gift who came from God originally. But he's teaching you how to be in unity. Not uniform, but in unity. You follow me? So for the next five weeks, I want to encourage you, I want you to encourage your family, I want you to encourage your friends to get to this church because we're going to be talking about kingdom culture. We're going to be talking about that there's nothing greater than the Bible to teach us. So we're just going to walk through. And what does Paul say about Jesus? What does Paul say about our society? What does Paul say about our true identity? has been given to us from God, the giver, and his most precious gift. Amen. Let us all stand. Guys, we first of all, no, God, we just thank you. Just thank you. 
We thank you for your word. We thank you for you just being a God that, God that comes near to us when we draw near to you. And I ask that as these next several weeks as we walk through Ephesians that you allow us to have breakthrough to operate out of our gifts and what you've called us to do in this kingdom. How you're teaching us to speak, how you're teaching us to walk, how you're teaching us to love. We come to you centering our lives around you and your son, Jesus, who gave us the Holy Spirit that lives and breathes and moves in us.